Good morning. A lot of fellowship going on here this morning, and that is good to hear, to be in the house of the Lord and to fellowship with one another uh, and to encourage one another and spur one another on. And so this morning as we start our worship service, I want to encourage you, and I want to be able to uh, spur you on to worship the Lord this morning. I want to read from Psalm 47, uh, starting in verse 6, as we kind of get in tune with uh, worshiping the Lord. It says this, it says, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Let's sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. Let's stand together this morning and let's sing to the King who sits on His holy throne. Sing with me. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation is this morning. He is worthy to be praised. You may be seated. Good morning, North Lake Baptist Church. It is so good to see you this morning. Welcome online uh, members and guests alike. We want to thank you for joining us uh, this morning uh, for worship. 
And if you're visiting with us, uh, we've got a gift bag for you. And we've got two fine young gentlemen ready to give you this gift bag. And so if you would kindly raise your hand, uh, we'd love to get you that gift bag. Uh, there's a visitor's card in there that you can complete uh, and put in the offering plate in just a moment. We'd love for you to do that so we can uh, connect with you uh, later on in the week. Thank you, uh, ushers, and thank you, guests. Church, let's open up our bulletins and look at our ministry week uh, this week. We've got a, some wonderful things coming, some wonderful opportunities uh, to share with you today. Our Trail Life and American Heritage Girls will be uh, meeting this afternoon at 4 o'clock, and following that will be choir practice, and then we will have our monthly conference, monthly business meeting uh, this evening. So be sure to come back this evening. Uh, Brother Corbin will be uh, opening God's Word and preaching this evening, and so be sure to join us. Uh, tomorrow night, our men's Bible study will continue. Our men's Bible study will continue. Our ladies uh, completed their study last week, so men, be ready to uh, come tomorrow night at 6.30. Uh, Wednesday, uh, normal activities, Awana, youth, an adult, and college Bible studies. Uh, then Thursday, senior adult rally, our Chattahoochee senior adult rally. And if you'd like to sign up, you can sign up over here. Uh, and we'll be uh, taking the bus and leaving the church here at 945 a.m. Also, next week, wanted to uh, let you know that our Family Foundations Sunday School class, those are for families uh, from in their 20s to 40s. So, yes, I can still join that this uh, cookout. Yes, uh, they'll have a cookout immediately following uh, the morning service next Sunday. So be sure uh, to uh, come for that. Uh, you can see Brother Corbin if you have any questions regarding that. Also, uh, it's getting close to Mother's Day on May 8th. And so we will be celebrating uh, mothers and having baby and child dedication. So if you have a baby or child that needs to be dedicated, uh, please contact us in the church office. We would uh, love to uh, get that going for you. And so we look forward to that on May 8th. Um, a bridal shower, what wonderful news. Elena Smith and Hayden Cook, a drop-in bridal shower on May 15th. Uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. And then a new uh, women's study on May 3rd through May 10th. Uh, they'll be looking at the book uh, by Franklin Graham, Living Beyond the Limits. Now, we also have an insert, students. We're going to the beach. And I've heard that our students haven't been to the beach in over a decade. And so uh, we're going to tackle going to the beach, and we're going to have a good time we're going to study uh, some New Testament characters who were early followers of Jesus. We're going to learn about them and how they can strengthen their faith uh, by looking at those characters in the New Testament. So be sure to sh sign up for that, and you can uh, contact the church office and call me if you have any questions regarding that beach retreat. Well, church, I talked to you last Sunday about our Annie Armstrong Easter offering, about how we were really close. Well, we have met and exceeded our goal uh, of $20,000. We are at $20,124 uh, to date. But that doesn't mean if uh, the Lord still lays upon your heart to give, that you can still give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And we have another video we'd like to share with you at this time. I was raised in a Christian home, but I gave my parents a really hard time. And so I finally decided to join the military because I wanted to do something hard and actually finish it. And it was actually towards the end of my military service when I gave my life to Christ. And having spent time in the Army, I know uh, that it can be a really spiritually dark place. They're young. They're far from family for the first time. They don't have maybe a lot of good influences. A lot of broken 
broken homes, marriages struggling, addiction, a desperate need for the gospel. There's a lot of young Marines here and they're living in the barracks. When we started this church, we knew that that was an area that God was calling us to reach, to host Marines for a Marine dinner. Once a month is where it started. To have something like a dinner that they can come to and just be themselves and sit on a couch and eat a warm meal is really impactful for them. More and more guys started coming and we baptized our first Marine last summer. And then that Marine led to another Marine and then another one to the point now where every week we're seeing fruit. This church like means business. Uh, they don't. They are not okay with you just punching your church card every week. <laughs> it was obvious that this was a church that was doing church like the Bible says we should do church. I feel encouraged every time I go to church. Like I wish every day was Sunday. When people give to Annie Armstrong, it enables churches like ours to reach military members and their families with the gospel. Washington D.C. is a city with many, many nations. So to have a gospel-centered, healthy church here is reaching not only the people in this city, but cities all across the world. The military is already moving people around, and as they are moved from place to place, they can take the gospel with them. It's exactly what Jesus has called us to do, and God is changing people's lives. Thank you, church. Um, I'd like to read a text, a passage, uh, I think that's appropriate today, about the response from the men on the road to Emmaus who met with Jesus and uh, what they said of that encounter. It's in, found in Luke uh, chapter 24, verse 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Church, will you join me as I pray? O Lord our God, May our hearts burn this morning as we worship in spirit and truth. Fan into flame the gift of God which you have given us, a gift of love, of power, and of a sound mind. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope many of you are still celebrating the resurrection of Christ as we did last Sunday, and hopefully that's something you celebrate every day of your life, that we have a chance to live for and honor and worship and exalt our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, each and every day. Uh, I know a lot of us, as we leave this building and we head out to our daily lives, sometimes it's difficult uh, with the way things are in the world today to, to be a light. It's difficult to maybe step out on faith sometimes, and it's just difficult based on the circumstances of where we are in our own lives. But I want to remind you that if you're relying on your own self, then life is going to be difficult. But if you rely upon the name of Jesus Christ and the power that is found in His name, that difficulty will wane more and more and more each and every day. For there is power in His name. As we prepare to sing, let me share with you from Philippians chapter 2. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. This morning, let's give Jesus Christ the glory by proclaiming just that. Proclaiming He is Lord and proclaiming there is only power in His name. Let's stand and sing together. One, two, three. <laughs>
I also want to welcome you to the house of the Lord. So good to see you here this morning. If you have your bulletins, look at the back page and we'll look at our prayer list. Our prayer verse today comes from Roman, Romans 11. Oh, the depth of riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. We do begin today with praises, as Brother Matt already mentioned. Our Annie Armstrong uh, giving was over the top, and we thank you for that, for your generosity to give to our North American Mission Board missionaries. On other financial matters, I've been asked several times about the offering from last week, 
And while it was terrific, it was not $152,000. So, so we'll try to get that uh, uh, squared away by next week. Uh, we also praise the Lord for Heath and Lucy in Virginia who came forward uh, at the end of the service on profession of faith and for baptism. So we praise the Lord for them. And also Jackie and Polly got answers to their prayers and good reports uh, from their tests. So we praise the Lord. We want to continue to pray for those who are our one. Who is your one that you're praying for and you're seeking to lead to faith in Jesus Christ? We want to pray for those in our church family. Uh, Donna Johnson had knee surgery last Monday. And one that we need to add is Brenda Wallace, who spent some time toward the end of the week at Northeast Georgia Medical Center uh, with an infection. So we pray for her to get well soon. We pray for our parents who are expecting children. Uh, you see the list of extended family and friends. Uh, also, under long-term care on the first line at the end, you see Joy Brown. That is a cousin to Cheryl Williams, and uh, she had cancer and passed away last night. So we want to remember that family in our prayers. Uh, also, we want to do want to remember our missionaries. Uh, you've already seen Jared Huntley, who stands for all the some 3,000 North American Mission Board missionaries who we're supporting with our prayers and with your gifts. Also, you see Horace Fortner there. He is in Ukraine on a short-term mission trip. So pray for him to be effective over there and to be returned safely to us. And also this morning, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jojo Thomas, who is our local missionary, Chattahoochee Baptist Association. And he leads uh, some 75 churches. I never know from day to day what the count is. Uh, but it's not enough for him to be able to come to North Lake every week. So when he does come, I always uh, get, want to give him an opportunity to speak to you. And I'll ask him also if he'll lead us in the morning prayer. Would you come forward, Brother Jojo? Show him some North Lake love here, okay? Thank you, Danny, and I do want to bring you a greeting from all your sister churches that make up the Chattahoochee Baptist Association. It is always a joy to be at North Lake, always a joy to know that we partner together to reach this region with the gospel and to make sure that a generation from now that the influence of the gospel where we live is greater than it's ever been. I ask you to join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for the chance to worship you today, to come apart, pull aside from all of the things that pull at our time and our attention and to focus our attention on you this morning. We thank you for the chance to sing your praise, and we ask that we could, in our praise and song, in our obedience to you as we worship, in our giving, in our obedience when we leave this place, and in every way we pray that we could make sure that your praise and glory shall not fail through all eternity. Father, thank you for this church, for the faithfulness of these people to give and to serve. Thank you for this pastor, for his faithfulness to bring your word day in and week in and week out. And thank you, Father, for the cross, for what you've done for each and every one of us, for the difference that it has made and you make in our lives. Give us the grace to point all people to it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Wow, you never want to follow children. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, please open to Matthew chapter 16. And what a joy it is to hear our children sing praises to the Lord and to teach us that Hebrew word, hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. And it's wonderful to hear them praise the Lord. We'll continue our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we took a break for Holy Week, uh, Palm Sunday through Resurrection Sunday. Last time we were in uh, Matthew chapter 15, but today we're going to Matthew 16, and I'm going to be reading from verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Again, last time we were in chapter 15 and verse 21, we studied uh, Jesus healing the daughter of the Canaanite woman and the interaction between them in a sermon we entitled Microaggressions. I'll not re-preach that. Verse 29, Jesus continued to heal the multitudes of people, bringing glory to God. In verse 32, you see where he fed 4,000. It's a similar story in application to our study on feeding the 5,000 in Matthew 14. You would think by now that people would be starting to figure out that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, but no. By the time you get to Matthew 16, you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other religious leaders still seeking more signs and miracles. You would think that feeding some 9,000 men plus women and children would be enough signs and wonders. Or if they look back to Matthew 15, 31, you would think that when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, the blind seeing, that they would figure out who Jesus is. But so far they have not. Then look at Matthew 16, verse 5. It seems like even the disciples seem to be in a fog. After Jesus walks away from the Pharisees, he tells the disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the disciples begin to murmur among themselves. You know why he's talking about leaven, don't you? You know why he's talking about left or leaven or yeast or baking powder? It's because we ain't got no bread. I want you to notice the patience of Jesus here. Being the Son of God, he could easily call down fire from heaven and vaporize these slow-learning disciples. But instead, what he did is he gave them another gentle rebuke for their lack of faith. And he said, look here, disciples, why are you murmuring that we don't have any bread? We just fed 5,000 men plus women and children. You took up 12 baskets of leftovers. We just fed 4,000 men plus women and children. You took up seven baskets of leftovers. I think I know how to make bread. When I said the leaven of the Pharisees, I'm talking about their false teaching. I'm talking about their lack of faith. I'm talking about their unbelief and their crazy theology. I'm not talking about baking powder. Then Jesus' sermon moves a little closer to home. In verse 13, Who do men, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say the other prophets. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who do you say that I am? Plenty of people were saying he's a prophet, he's a great rabbi, he's a great teacher, he's a good man. But Matthew wanted to tell future generations that those answers are unacceptable. Jesus is the Son of God. You either receive him as your Savior and your Lord, or you reject him as a phony or a fraud, but you don't have any other choices. I want to briefly run through, hope you've still got your Bibles open, I want to briefly run through Matthew's, or at least some of Matthew's proof here, that Jesus is the Son of God. If you'll turn back to Matthew chapter 1, and we'll see proof number one, that Jesus is the Son of God because the prophets had prophesied of him. You see that in verses 22 and 23, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the Old Testament prophets told of the entrance of a Messiah into this world. They said he would be virgin-born, prophet-announced, spirit-filled, and God the Father approved. He would be God in the flesh. He would be Emmanuel. He would be God with us. And all these prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. 
Now look on to the second proof. You see that in Matthew chapter 3. The second proof is Jesus is the Son of God. John the Baptist testified of him. The Lord told John the Baptist to go and baptize people in the Jordan River, and he said, one of these days, somebody will come to baptism, and whenever you baptize that person, the literal Spirit of God in the shape of a dove will come down upon that person and descend upon them, and you will know that that's the Messiah. And when John saw it, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The third proof that Matthew is going to offer us is in chapter 3 and verse 17. And we see Jesus Christ as the Son of God because God the Father introduced him. After Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water, God the Father spoke from the heavens and he introduced Jesus saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The third proof we, we see, uh, the fourth proof we see here is Matthew chapter 8, if you'll turn there. Matthew chapter 8. Verses 26 and 27, you'll see that Jesus is the Son of God. Even the natural world obeys Him. Here Jesus is out at sea, and they got a storm comes up, and He spoke to the storm, and the winds died down, and the sea became calm, and the disciples said among themselves, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey Him? You know, that's a great question. I mean, here we are in the modern world. We have meteorologists who can't reliably predict the weather over the next five days. Yet here you got Jesus Christ. He's actually in control of the weather. And not only the weather obeys him, but also even plants and animals obey him. On Palm Sunday, if you remember, uh, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on what the Bible calls a cult on which no one had ever sat. Now, let me ask you, how many of y'all have ever rode on a cult on which no one has ever sat? We have a term for that in English. It's called a rodeo. <laughs> so, but here, this cult stood still. Why? Because it recognized its creator. Uh, a little bit later on, Jesus goes by a fig tree who chose not to have any fruit that year. That was a bad thing. Jesus speaks to it, and it wilts faster than Roundup. Why? Because it responds to its creator. It turns out all creation, all the natural world, responded to their creator except for man. As it says in the Old Testament, prophet Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 7, The stork in the heaven knows her appointed time, the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow. They all observe the time of their coming or their migration, but my people do not know the judgment of God. But notice Jesus, the natural world, responded to their creator. Look at proof number 5. We'll find that also in Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Jesus is the Son of God, even the demons recognize him these demons or fallen angels or satan's henchmen or whatever you want to call them they enjoyed torturing people torturing mankind with sickness and depression and spiritual oppression and demon possession and they never stopped their destruction for anyone except jesus see jesus was able to stop them why because they knew who he was they called him jesus the son of god Here's a sad reality right there. Is the demons are more spiritually perceptive than all these educated and sophisticated religious leaders out of Judea. Jesus' half-brother James would later write in James 2.19, You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Look on to proof number 6. See that in Matthew 17. Matthew 17, Jesus is the Son of God. The transfiguration revealed him. Peter, James, John had the opportunity to see Jesus in all his glory. They met Elijah and Moses, who they thought were already dead, but no, uh, they have eternal life. They're still alive. They got to see those guys, and again, they heard God the Father speak of my beloved Son, Peter was so impressed by this sight that he would never forget it. And later on, when he was writing in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he said, We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. With such a voice came to him from the excellent glory that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice. And came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So again, yet another proof that Jesus Christ is not just some rabbi. He is the Son of God. Let's look on to proof number 7. You see that in Matthew chapter 26. 
Matthew chapter 26, verses 63 and 64. In uh, similar passages in the other Gospels as well, Jesus is the Son of God because he said it himself. The chief priest asked, Are you the Christ, the Son of God? In Matthew, Jesus said, It is as you said. That's yes. Also, Mark says simply, I am. Now, I realize we have some modern liberal scholars who say that Jesus never claimed to be God, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, and that the disciples gave him those titles years after his death. Well, all I can say about that is these liberal scholars either do not read or do not believe the New Testament because Jesus answered in the affirmative. He said, I am. He said, yes, that he is the Christ. It's a simple statement, but if you ever study the Old Testament, I, I am has a, a complex meaning to it. Of course, I am is the positive answer to the question. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And the answer is, I am. That means yes. But another thing, I am is also the Old Testament name of God. If you remember, it's given to Moses at the burning bush. Uh, Anglicized, it's Jehovah. We uh, assume from Hebrew that it's Yahweh. Basically, it's translated, I am that I am. It means he is the self-existent one. All the rest of us are because somebody else did. Amen? But he's the only one who says, I am because I am. That is the name of God. And, and again, if this is true, then we need to be paying attention to Christ. And if it's false, then Jesus Christ is guilty of blasphemy and he deserved death for leading so many people astray and dashing their hopes. If Jesus is not the Son of God, then he was a liar. How can he be called a great teacher or a good man or even a true prophet if it was not true? You know, in my short lifetime, several people have claimed to be the Messiah. Some of you may remember Jim Jones. No relation, by the way. But Jim, <laughs> but Jim Jones, back in 1978, claimed to be the Messiah. He led 914 men, women, and children to their death by drinking cyanide lace Kool-Aid in Jonestown, Guyana. Later, there was David Koresh, 1993, called himself the Lamb of God and Jesus Christ. He led his Branch Davidians to a standoff with FBI and ATF agents, resulting in 85 deaths when the compound in Waco, Texas, exploded in a fireball. And then there was a Canadian guy, Luc Jurette, 1994. He had a picture of himself portrayed as Jesus Christ on one of his chapels in Chieri, Switzerland. 53 people committed suicide following him. In 1997, 39 people in Heaven's Gate cult committed mass suicide at the direction of their leader, Marshall Applewhite, who called himself the present representation of the spirit that filled Christ 2,000 years ago. Now, somebody tell me, when you hear the story of these guys, do these sound like true prophets? Do they sound like great teachers? Do they sound like good men? No, at best, they're deranged, and at worst, they're demon-possessed deceivers. C.S. Lewis was an agnostic uh, British philosopher who set out to disprove Christianity and in the end ended up becoming a Christian. He draws the same conclusion in his book called Mere Christianity. He said, I'm not trying here to prevent, uh, he said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. And that is, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis said a man who was merely a man said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil from hell. You must make your choice. Either Jesus was and is the Son of God or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall down at his feet and call him Lord and God but let us not come with any of this patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open for us. How many of you think C.S. Lewis is pretty strong there? It's a strong statement, but guess what? It's a true statement. Again, we go back to life's ultimate question to us from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is who do you say that I am? Let's move on to Matthew 27 to look at proof number eight. And that is Jesus is the Son of God, even the Roman centurion figured it out. You know, Roman centurions were tough guys. Uh, these are guys who supervised crucifixions. They were not known for being spiritual or sensitive or sentimental. 
They were promoted for their cruelty and their brutality. They were trained killers. This uh, centurion had no doubt crucified hundreds of people before. Uh, centurions were the enforcer and executioner of Roman law. But this execution was different. This centurion watched as the Roman governor Pilate had Jesus whipped and then crucified, but all the time Pilate was protesting about the innocence of Jesus Christ. Pilate even washed his hands and said, I find no fault in him. Now to the Roman centurion, that was kind of different. And then the time that they nailed him to the cross, there were three hours of darkness when that crucifixion of Christ began. You know, in America, we fly our flags at half staff whenever one of our patriots dies. But in this case, God the Father lowered the clouds to half mass for three hours, plunging all mankind into darkness of their sin. And I'm sure the Roman centurion thought, well, that one was different. And then there was the earthquake. When Jesus breathed his last breath, there was an earthquake that rocked the city of Jerusalem. And again, I'm just a Roman centurion, but that's different. He'd never seen that before. You know, this centurion was not a theologian, but it didn't take him long to figure out that Almighty God somewhere up there was not happy with what was going on at Golgotha today. So this centurion confessed, truly this man was the Son of God. Amen. Proof number nine that we celebrated last week, Matthew 28, 5. Jesus is the Son of God. The resurrection vindicated him. The angels meet people out there in the cemetery and said, He is not here. He is not here in this graveyard. Why? Because he is risen. Acts chapter 2, verse 24, Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he said, God raised up Jesus, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that Jesus could be held by death. Why was that? It's because his heavenly Father is our fountain of life, and it's impossible that death could hold him. So Jesus left behind his glory in order to come down here, to left behind the glory that he shared with the Father from all eternity and came down to earth to live and teach us how to live, to go to Calvary's cross and die for our sins so that we could have forgiveness of sin and to rise from the dead, offering eternal life to all who would believe and put their hope and faith and trust in him and then to ascend back to the right hand of the Father where he started and proving once and for all that Jesus is, in fact, God the Son. Jesus asked the question of Peter. He also asked the same question from you and me. Who do you say that I am? Is he just a good man? Is he just a great teacher? Is he just one of the prophets? No, the Lord didn't give you those options. You've either got to decide uh, the only answer that works in the end is going to be you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those other answers simply will not work for you. So as we draw to a conclusion, what I wanted to ask you is, why is this confession so important? Well, the first reason that confession is so important is because it determines your relationship with God. In John 1, 12, it says, For as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. You must believe Jesus is the Son of God in order to be adopted as a child of God and into the family of God. If you go around and just ask people randomly, are you a Christian? I often hear things like, I try to be a good neighbor. I try to be a good person. I don't have many bad habits. I try to keep the commandments. I try to live by the Sermon on the Mount. I try to live by the Golden Rule. And all that's great. But Christianity is not based on keeping those rules. Christianity is based on a personal relationship with God. You know, lots of people do good things. A lot of people try to do well. But listen to what Jesus said about that in Matthew 7, uh, 20. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons, done many wonders in your name? Then I will say to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. You see, getting into heaven is not about what you did it's about who you know. Now, what you did is important, for at the judgment, your works will determine the amount of reward that you will receive in heaven or the degree of punishment that you will receive in hell, according to the Scriptures. But it's who you know that gets you accepted 
or rejected at heaven's gate. Because according to Ephesians 1, 6, God the Father has decided that it's only through faith in Jesus Christ that we are accepted into the Beloved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 tells us, Nor is there salvation in any other name. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. So why is this confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, so important? Well, first, it determines your relationship with God. And second, that confession determines your eternal destiny. In John chapter 3 and verse 35, it says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the gospel, the good news is that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you'll be forgiven of your sins and you'll be given everlasting life. And in John 5, 27, the Bible says that one day, every one of us will stand before the Lord Jesus and have to give an account for us. Jesus Christ has been made the judge of all the earth. Now, I know that don't fit with a lot of jokes that go out there. I know the jokes say that one of these days we'll stand before St. Peter at the pearly gates. Let me go ahead and tell you that's not true. We will all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in judgment. And the first question that we'll have to deal with there is while you were down here on earth, who did you say that I am? Who did you say that Jesus is? The only answer that will save you is some form of the following, and that is you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Son of man. You are the Son of God. You are fully man, and you are fully God. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. Amen. Now let me ask you as we come to a close, is that your confession? If you were to die right now, sometime today, and had to stand before the Lord, what would your answer be? Is that your confession while you were down here? Can you go back to a time and place where you repented of your sins and asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Savior and be your Lord? If not, won't you trust Him today? Another thing about that is according to the Gospel of Mark chapter 8, it must be a public profession. It's not enough that you whispered under your breath and say, I believe Jesus is Lord. No, He said, if you're ashamed of me in front of this wicked and adulterous generation, then I'll be ashamed of you when you have to stand before me on that judgment day. So if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord, never made a public profession of faith by being baptized and joining other believers in the church, won't you make that decision today? I'll be standing down front here in just a moment, and I'd love to show you how if you don't know how. But maybe you're part of the other group in here that's made a profession of faith in the past, but since then, you've kind of become timid and tongue-tied about sharing your faith with Jesus Christ, with your family, with your friends, with your one that we've been talking about for over a year now. And uh, I, I just ask you today, if that's you, then uh, rededicate yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his great commission of going into all the world and making disciples out of anybody who will stand still long enough to hear you tell them about Jesus and will put their faith and trust in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for a clear word. We thank you for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who gave us enough information to know that you were no ordinary man, you were no ordinary teacher, rabbi. You were not just some good guy. You were God from heaven. You were the Lord himself who chose to come down and take our place, relate to us, pay for our sins, and offer us eternal life. In order for us to receive that, you could have done all kinds of things. You could have made us got some advanced degree. You could have made us uh, climb the highest mountains. You could have made us swim across the mightiest rivers. But all you did is you said, it's all right there in your heart. If you'll just trust me. If you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you will be saved. We pray for someone here today that's never made that confession that today is the day that they would be saved. Lord, uh, we, we ask you to come among us now by the power of your Holy Spirit. Work among us mightily, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is our time of invitation. Our altar is open. If you need to come and pray, you can come pray about anything on your heart. No, we've got praying people in the building who, without knowing your business, will be asking God to bless you 
with whatever issue is going on in your life. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior, I'll be standing down front. And I'd love to take your hand and show you from the Word of God how you can be saved if you don't know how. If you've already maybe prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you, but you never made that public profession of faith, you can do that today. And sometimes it can seem intimidating, but in this crowd of folks here, I can tell you from experience, they'd rejoice to see you come forward and make that profession of faith in Christ. Won't you do that today? Maybe you've been saved and baptized and your church membership is somewhere else and you feel like the Lord is leading you to join this church and find your place of service here. Won't you join our church today? And maybe the Lord has some kind of special calling on your life. Uh, I can tell you from experience many years ago that the Lord don't show you how it's done until you say yes. You gotta get past that yes point. So if you've never trusted Christ as far as a calling that he's placed on your life, won't you start that today? Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as we stand together and sing our hymn of invitation. This morning said she's saved and sure she's prayed and asked Jesus Christ to become her Savior and Lord and now she wants to be obedient to following believers baptism and to join our church and all you who rejoice in Maddox's decision say amen, amen. 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 All right. we're gonna ask y'all to be seated for just a moment y'all too uh, Got something I need to share with you, and then I want Maddox to come back and their parents to stand at the back with me so that they can greet, uh, greet you and welcome you into our fellowship. Uh, today I'm announcing my intention to retire as pastor of North Lake Baptist Church and from active pastoral ministry at the end of this church year, August 31st, 2022. 
I plan to continue on into my 70s or 80s uh, if my health remained good, but since my coronary bypass surgery on April 1st of 2019, I've noticed a decrease in my energy and memory. Uh, some of y'all have told me that's because I'm over 65 now, but I'm going to blame it on heart surgery. <laughs> also, within one year of my surgery, we went into the COVID crisis, which required us all to operate outside our comfort zones with methods and restrictions, which neither I nor anyone else could have anticipated. However, the Lord has continued to bless his work at North Lake, and we have continued to grow with 90 new members during the past three years and a few hundred new online friends of North Lake that view our services each Sunday and Wednesday, which is exceedingly abundantly above anything that I could ask or think. In spite of the hardships of the last three years, you have continued to generously give to this ministry in such a manner that North Lake has almost raised enough money to soon begin work on the long-awaited new sanctuary. With all these exciting ministry opportunities, it's hard to step aside, but I believe the Lord has revealed to me that it's time for a new pastor to lead North Lake Baptist Church on to the next level of ministry. The church bylaws requires a minimum of two weeks' notice for resignation or retirement, but since in August I will have been your pastor for 15 years, I thought I'd give the church some additional notice so our church leaders can put together a plan for a smooth transition to a new pastor. The North Lake Baptist Church Operations Manual says the pastor search team shall be elected as follows. The officers of the deacon body, which is the chairman, the vice chairman, and secretary, shall serve as a team to nominate to the church for election the person who will serve as chairperson of the pastor search team. After election, the chairperson shall serve the deacon officers as a team to nominate to the church for election other members to serve on this pastor search team. Our current deacon leaders are Bill Skilling, uh, Chairman of Deacons, Charles Britt, uh, Vice Chairman of Deacons, Philip Love, the Secretary of Deacons. I encourage you to be in prayer for these men and encourage them as they will be leading the church during this time of transition. Again, this is a very difficult decision to make, but I feel it's in the best interest for the future of North Lake Baptist Church. Laura and I have been truly blessed to be a part of the North Lake family these 15 years. We love you, and we will always be praying for you uh, that the Lord will continue to bless you all. And uh, thank you for your time. So we'll ask you to stand to your feet. We'll ask Brother Bill Skilling to come and dismiss us in prayer. And we'll ask Maddox and her family if they'll come to the back and stand with us, and y'all can welcome her into our fellowship. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for how you bless this church and how you bless this church under the leadership of Pastor Danny, Lord. I know that's what drew my family here was the sound doctrine, the sound teaching that Pastor Danny provided for us. He was faithful in teaching, sound doctrine, faithful in sharing the gospel, faithful not only in preaching and teaching in season, Lord, but especially out of season, never allowing the culture to change the biblical truth, but using biblical truth to change the culture. And I just thank you for how he's been so unapologetic in teaching your word, and is thankful in his discipleship, thankful in his shepherding us, thankful in his counseling in our time of need and being there when we're sick or having health issues, being at the hospital. Lord, I just thank you for how you use Pastor Danny to lead our church. I'm so grateful, Lord, that even in his planning of retirement, he, he worked with us and the leadership of the uh, deacons to help us prepare for this moment, Lord. And I'm just grateful for all the time I've had with him as my pastor, as I'm sure the whole church is. I just pray you bless this time of retirement to Laurel, and I know that he just won't retire, retire, Lord. I know he'll be serving you all the days of his life, as he has been. And Lord, I just pray, too, that we would be faithful in being able to answer the question, who do you say that I am? You are the Son of God, my Savior, my Lord. 
that we are found faithful in sharing with others the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And I just pray that you will uh, continue to be with the leadership as we pursue our pastor, our next pastor. And Lord, I want to thank you right now, knowing that you already have chosen another man of God like Danny, who will divide your work accurately, who will stay true to your word, in spite of the cultural influences and changes that are going around us. I pray you're preparing this man's heart and his family to come to North Lake Baptist Church, and I'm trusting, Lord, that that is indeed what you're doing. Just pray this all in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Amen.